Let's talk a little bit more about timers and counters. I lump the two together even though in this module I'll show you how to use timers more specifically than counters. I lump them together because they are similar types of instructions. One essentially counts time while the other counts events. Uh, the timer counts time obviously. But the timers have different options than counters have and fundamentally they're, they're different because with a counter you could have a count up, count down, uh, you know, you could make the count increase or decrease. With time, you don't really get time running backwards. On the other hand, with a timer, all that a timer really is, is a delay. And so what it does is you put a signal into it and after a certain amount of time, it lets that signal pass through. That's really all that the timer instruction does in this click uh, programming software. I always prefer to demonstrate instructions in the context of some use, whether that use be particularly practical or not. So I've opened up a particular simula simulator in Factory I.O. and I want to kind of show you around it. Let me back out just a little bit. It's a buffer conveyor system. So there's a buffer conveyor on the left and on the right is what they call an exit conveyor. And then there's a um, remover over here on the right that if you've got boxes coming through on the conveyor, once it slides down the remover removes the boxes. And there's what they call an emitter over on the left hand side, sort of behind the control box, that puts boxes onto the uh, conveyor. Now the controls, or the, the control user interface buttons that we have are all here on the panel. There's a start, reset, stop, emergency stop. They're all, well except for the emer emergency stop, they're all illuminated which means they've got light bulbs built into them that are separate outputs that you can turn on if you want to. <clears throat> I don't um, have a particular need to do that in, in this case. Let me see if I can move up just a little. There we are. We also have a counter, and the counter is not a counter instruction. It's not something in the PLC. This counter is really just a display. So you could display the count of boxes that have gone by. And then there's a knob here for uh, controlling the speed of the conveyor if you wish. Really all it does is put a number into the PLC and you can make that do whatever you wish then afterward. And then there's a, a switch here for uh, automatic and manual mode. So that's a quick overview of the system. There are a few sensors. For example, there's a sensor that is at the entry to the buffer conveyor. So as a box goes across here, this particular sensor will uh, go from false to true. And then there's another uh, sensor here. And this particular sensor, you know, I don't know if it is, ret it looks like it's retro reflective. So since there's nothing there, it seems like we'd be getting a true back. Let's check and see. We'll turn the simulation on. And let me actually go into the, um, let's see, tags. <clears throat> and I'm going to force this to stop. I don't want the boxes to come through. So we'll, let's see, try to get it to zero. If we can, let's see, there we go. I'll turn off the exit conveyor as well. And just reset the simulator because I don't really want anything on the conveyor right now. So if we look at the in, uh, at entry at, at buffer entry switch, it's off, which makes sense because there's no box there. I've just cleared the simulator, so there are no boxes. Well, I guess there's one at the uh, emitter, but there's no boxes certainly tripping that sensor. And and so this is looking for reflection, right? If there's a box in front of, there's some reflection that gets back to the center, sensor, and then the sensor turns on. On the other hand, the other two sensors are retro-reflective. The one at the exit of the exit conveyor and the one at the exit of the buffer conveyor. Those, these are just little mirrors here on the end. And what they do is they reflect the, the light beam. And when the light beam is broken, then the sensors turn off. So you could think of these if you wanted to as being uh, normally closed. So normally passing power unless something is blocking. And you can think of the sensor at the entry to the buffer conveyor as being normally open. So that's uh, what we have. The motors can be controlled that continuously. They're not uh, on-off conveyors, so they don't have just one speed. You can you know, change it to whatever you want. I'm not going to have the PLC control those right now. I'm just going to force them, essentially. I'm going to, in the simulator, make them go. And, you know, for fun, I'll show you how you can... Uh, play around with these sensors to understand what they do. You can actually pick up the box and then watch uh, the at buffer entry sensor. When I drop this box, it's reflecting the light onto the sensor and so you see the sensor comes on. On the other hand, 
If I take it over here and drop it, let's see if I can. Uh, let's see. Let me move over just a wee bit. There we are. Now if I drop it where it blocks this or pull it through this beam, you'll notice that at buffer exit turns off. So there it goes. If I did that, if I, I took this box all the way to the end of the exit conveyor, I can make the at exit go off. Of course, as soon as I remove it from here, then the at exit or at uh, buffer exit would turn back on. And of course, I can just let it fall off the side of the conveyor if I wish. Now, all of these things are already set up. I've chosen uh, address ranges for Modbus communication so that the inputs and outputs can be communicated from the PLC to uh, factory I.O. Uh, there is a uh, buffer velocity. This is that knob input. I'm not going to use it this time. But the other items over here, the buffer conveyor, exit conveyor, and the counter are both read and write. So these need to be memory in the PLC that I can read to and or that I can write that factory IO can write into and that factory IO can read from. I'm already connected to the PLC. If you look at the configuration, uh, I've just done the normal thing where I've got the digital inputs. Uh, since we can't use the actual inputs on the PLC, I've put them in address space that is just the coil address space. So I have to use coils instead of actual inputs. And then the digital outputs are just in the, the Y address range. So that does work. So factory I.O. Um, or, or the PLC can set outputs in the Y address and now the uh, factory I.O. can actually read those outputs and know whether you know uh, uh, things are on or off and model it accordingly. Uh, for example, one of the things I didn't mention is that there is a uh, what they call a stop blade here and I can force it on so you can see what it does. If I turn it on you see that it rises. If I turn it off it shuts off and it, it's forced right now. In other words it's not under the control of the PLC so I'm going to release it so the PLC could control it. We might do something fun with that. I don't know. <clears throat> I haven't decided exactly how I'm going to demonstrate timers for you. Uh, so if we go to configuration then the register inputs, uh, there's only one of them, and this is that knob that I was talking about. I've put it in on address 3, and if you look up at Modbus address 3, it's actually 40000 um, in the PLC, it's 4, so it's minus 1 is 3. So it's, but, the, but that first 4 is, you know, you can just drop it off and you can drop off leading 0. So the address that I'm uh, really putting the knob into is address DS3. This, this is a DS range. It's the type of variable. They're just integer variables, 16-bit numbers. And it turns out that apparently the Click software, while it uses 16 bits for integers, those integers, as far as I can tell, often can only go up to 32767 instead of the full 65535. And what that means is that they're only using 15 bits out of a 16-bit word or out of two bytes. And the reason you might do that is because you might want to reserve the most significant bit for a plus or minus sign. Um, why they did that, I don't know. In some contexts, it doesn't make sense. I would have used what's called an unsigned integer. With that bit reserve, it's called a signed integer. In other words, you're attaching a sign. You're reserving one of the bits to be the S-I-G-N, the sign. Uh, and that limits the, the range, the number of numbers you can store, because you've thrown away one bit, essentially, or, you know, you can still store the same amount of numbers, just some of them are negative and some of them are positive. But that limits the maximum positive number that you can store. I guess technically it limits the maximum ne negative number also. But then register outputs, it looks like I haven't put anything in here. Actually, this is the beginning of the DS addresses. So the, I've got three different registers for the, uh, let's see, the buffer exit, exit conveyor, and counter where the buffer exit and exit conveyor would control the speed of those conveyors and then the counter is that display that I showed you on the control uh, panel. But those are referenced to DS1, DS2, DS3 and I've already in input all of the names in the addresses that are needed. So if I go to the address picker you'll notice that in the um, C addresses which I'm using for inputs I've already named at buffer entry, at buffer exit and so forth for all my sensors for the outputs, <clears throat> uh, I have not named them yet, so I will do that now. 
I thought I had, but I guess I have not. So let me move factory I.O. to the other side. <coughs> and then the Y addresses. Uh, let's see. We've got a stop blade. That'd probably be fun to use. We'll see. If, maybe we'll see if we can knock a box off by timing it just right. So a stop blade and then Y002. We'll assign that uh, start light. Now notice I've already put the Modbus addresses in, right? I had the, what was it, 8192 I think it was. If I display the Modbus addresses, the Y's begin at 8193. So 8192 is what I put in and that's Y001. It's, it's off by one. It's zero versus one indexed. Um, so reset light. This is the lamp in the reset button and then stop light. There we are. Now if I say OK that should save all those names. Now let's see what we can do. Let's, let's just do something simple. Let's start off by implementing a timer. So we'll put a timer here and, and a timer is like a counter. It has elements that go as outputs and part of it is input. So unfortunately just like counters like CT1 for example, timers, the, the name of the timer and the bit when it's done is a, a little confused. So T1, for example, is the first timer. There's, there's a bunch of timers. I mean, if I go back into it, I could have chosen any number of timers. Uh, none of these are being used. Let's see, in fact, how many timers have we? If we go all the way up to uh, T500, well, there's 500 timers in here that we can use. So we've got plenty. Uh, so I'll just grab the first one. Oh, and by the way, there was a Mythbusters episode. I'll try to find it on YouTube and, and post it for you. I think it was where uh, it happened when the uh, other three Mythbusters had left, where it was just Jamie and Adam again, maybe the next to last season or so. And they were testing a myth, an Indiana Jones myth, where there were arrows shooting across at him after he had grabbed the idol and was running and the stone was chasing him and everything. And uh, they were testing the myth, uh, you know, could you actually outrun these? If, if your, your foot on the stone triggered uh, something being shot at you, could you get through unscathed? And turned out you could. It was really interesting because so, several times during their shows, I would watch them rig up a very complicated electrical control system. And in this particular episode, there were multiple paintball guns they had set up along the corridor where uh, Adam ended up running. And um, it was interesting because they had timers all the way down. So the, there was like there was this signal that had a, a delay and they could set the delay for each timer. But they had all these uh, electromechanical timers set up to perform this function, they could have used a single PLC. Now I'm sure they knew it. Probably they chose the timers because it's easier to understand what they're doing. But one PLC would have plenty of timers in it to accomplish this task. And so, on the other hand, maybe they just don't know PLC programming, but uh, certainly would have made that episode easier and would have made several of their uh, tasks easier. But anyway, <clears throat> the set point is just how long the delay occurs. And what do I mean by that? Well, the, the type of timer that I'm using right now, the default selection, is what's called an on delay timer. And what that means is you're going to have an input. In fact, let me go ahead and just put a number in here for set point so we can discuss it. And that way I'll have it sitting off to the side and you can see it. That'll be helpful. So this, the set point is really just, okay, when the enable syst, uh, signal comes in and is maintained high, okay, the timer will run. It will accumulate time. And once the time it has accumulated is at or beyond the set point, whatever I put in, which in this case is a thousand milliseconds, which would be a second, then the output of that timer will actually come on, or a bit of that timer comes on. Unfortunately, the name of that bit is T1. So what I'm going to do is just set up a timer that times, let's see, a thousand, let's make it 10,000 milliseconds. 10,000 milliseconds would be 10 seconds. And uh, TD1 will be where the actual value, the current value, is stored. So what I will do, uh, let's see, I don't know if the counter can display that large a number, but what I'm going to do is simply have no conditions. So this timer will simply run once I turn on the, you know, once I download the PLC and put it in run mode. So I have to get over to the simulator pretty quick so you can see what I'm trying to do here. And demonstrate but I'm going to make something happen when the timer is done so unfortunately like I said we have to address the bit the done bit of the timer 
by the same name as the timer when we're using a set of contacts. So what will happen is the PLC program will start running. This rung has no condition, so it's simply true. And so enable will drive the timer and the timer will count up time. Now, once the timer is done, then this bit T1 will come on and I can make a light come on. So let's make, I don't know, let's make a, uh, you know what, let's just make the, the uh, start light come on. That'll be fine. Or, let's see, I think they've got stop all the way on the right. So let me choose stop. There's a reason for it. We'll do that. So once this timer is done running, the stop light on the control panel will come on. At least that's what I think should, ha should happen. Let's see. Let's turn off the tags. And we'll go over here. Now, I don't just want to um, see the, uh, what did I choose, the stop light. I don't just want to see it come on. I want to see the current value in the timer be displayed on my so-called counter here. So actually I think I'll switch over and I'll use a start light because it's closer to the display for the counter so let's change that around and let's see use the start light there we are <clears throat> now the value in the timer that's in memory if you look you can look at the address picker and see where the memory is uh, TD1 or TD addresses are here TD1 this is an integer it's where the the current time the accumulated time is stored okay so I guess I could uh, actually monitor it as well if I hit data view and then look at the DF and DS I was looking at other things before so let me uh, just delete these rows I don't really want to see them right now um, I, I'll leave the counter in there because I do want to see it and I also, though, let me change the address here. Instead of a DS address, I'm going to look at the amount of time on the timer. So it's, it's interesting because the timer has a couple of different things associated with it, a couple of different memory addresses. There's the, the T1 address, which is a bit, and there's the TD1, which is the, the number, which apparently now right now is 29. I don't know why it's at 29. But you know, whatever, I don't really care. I'm counting up to 10,000, so 29 out of 10,000 is not much. So if I download this, uh, in fact, let me close, and I can go ahead and download it, but I won't put it in run mode right yet. Oh, there's a syntax error. Yes, I forgot the end. Oh, and I forgot to set it up to put the count over on you know, the display, on the counter display. So I'm just going to use a copy command. And what I'm going to grab is just TD1, which is the accumulated value in our timer. And I'm going to write that out to the display. So I'll choose, uh, let's see, the display is in the DS range because that's the only place I could put it. And what I want it to output on is the counter address. The, the address, the DS address I've tied to the counter in Modbus. So there we are. Uh, in fact, let me show you that so that you understand it. Uh, DS3, if I display the Modbus address for that, it's four, four zeros, three. We can drop that first four. We can drop all the first zeros. So this is address three, but this is one based. Over in um, factory IO world, it's zero based, so that would actually be address two. So if you look at the drivers, uh, address two is right here, see? So input register address two which is the Modbus address. So that all matches each other and will talk the way I want it to. Now I'm still not quite done because uh, what I want to do is make this actually work and so I will add an end instruction. Now there's one thing that students often confuse about timers. They think that they somehow revert back to um, structured, tech, uh, structured text types of programming where the program goes to one line, it does whatever's on that line, it stays on that line until it's done. If you put a delay on the line, it's living at that line and not going to any of the other code until it moves on to the next line, until that delay is done. In a, the PLC world, the whole program is scanned. And what that means is that the first rung is evaluated and then it moves on. So you'll notice what, it, what really this rung says is, hey, turn on that timer. So what the PLC will do is it'll start scanning, it'll hit this rung, 
and the rung is instructing it to turn on the timer. If the timer's already running, it just leaves the timer running and goes to the next. If the timer is not running, it starts it and goes on to the next. So it doesn't wait for that timer to be done. Okay, it just turns it on and says, okay, fine, now what do we do? So here what it does, in the next, it says, is the timer done? Well, the PLC is going to move through this like that, right? It's going to go line one, line two almost instantly, and the timer won't be near done. Ten seconds will not have elapsed, so this bit will not be true, which means the start light should be off. So it'll say, fine, start light is uh, off. It goes on to the next rung. Since there are no conditions here, every scan, this will copy the value, the current value that's in the timer over to the counter. Uh, or the counter display over here. And then it goes back and starts all over again. And it runs through this very, very rapidly. You know, you can easily have a thousand scans in one second. A one millisecond scan time is not unreasonable with today's PLCs. So that's how this is actually working. But for some reason, students, I, I guess students get used to using delays and things in other programming languages. And then they think that a timer will be like a delay. It will just make the program wait right there. And that's not what it does at all in PLC programming. So let's write this into the PLC. Let's see, we're running uh, factory I.O. It's in uh, run mode, change to stop. <coughs> Transfer is complete. Now, if I go to run mode, uh, let's see, I'm not going to go to run mode next. So I'm going to go to stop. I could have hit cancel, it doesn't matter. Because I wanted to bring up the data view so that we could kind of contrast what's going on in uh, what the PLC software is telling us versus what factory I.O. sees. So now we should be able to monitor the value and as soon as I hit run here, what should happen is we should see this address TD1 start to increase because the rung preceding the timer is true so it should start accumulating time and just continuously accumulate time because the PLC is scanning the whole thing. After 10 seconds we should see T1 go true which should turn on the start light. Now I think also what will happen is we will see the numbers flash by on this, this display pretty quickly. So let's see what happens. So we, all, we should also be able to see it here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we should be able to see the time here and these two numbers should match because this is what I'm writing out. This DS3 is what I'm writing out to the counter display, which is not really a counter. It's a timer display now. And TD1 is the value, the accumulated value. So we'll go into run and see what happens. So you see the numbers going up. We've got about three seconds down. The start light is not illuminated because the timer is not done. Once the timer is done, the start light should come on. There it is. Now you notice that since the rung is true, the timer just keeps going. It doesn't just stop. And I don't know how long, uh, how, how much space TD1 can hold. I'm wondering what will happen when it overflows because it looks like they're using an integer which would be 65535 or maybe 32767. So let's see if it rolls back over. Ah, it stopped at 32767. So it went up to the maximum number that TD1 could hold and then it just stopped there. But it worked. It did exactly what I thought it would do. Uh, displayed the, the amount of time that has elapsed here and then um, eliminated the button after it was done and you can see that these two match just as we expected so here we're on, on this side we're basically looking into the brain of the PLC through the PLC programming software here we've got the simulated system showing us what would happen in the real world if we had a PLC controlling the system in this way so we don't really need this anymore we understand how that works let's change this timer just a little bit did you notice that there are other units those were milliseconds and the time was just flying by how well would an operator like to see 10 seconds elapse on that uh, uh, that display and see it fly by in milliseconds? Well, it's probably better to show it in seconds, and then we could use just 10, right? As a matter of fact, the maximum number you should be able to put in here, since it's an integer, would be 65535. But for some reason, uh, if you try 65535, it will not accept it. See how the check mark is red. In fact, the biggest number you can put in is 32767. If you put 32768, it does not accept it. So basically, it's using what's called a signed integer here. Since there's no such thing as negative time, I wish they had used 65535. I wish they had used an unsigned integer here. If you think about what this means in terms of the amount of time and the precision that you can 
uh, can time things for. If you go down to millisecond precision, then a difference of one millisecond can be detected, right? So 32,767, if we convert that, 32,767 milliseconds into seconds, we just divide by a thousand. So we can time down to a precision of, of 32.767 seconds, right? But if you need 33.50 seconds, you can't do it with one timer. Now you can do it with two timers, but you can't do it with one timer. So it's a little bit strange how the precision sort of uh, breaks off. If we go to seconds, for example, how many seconds or how many minutes is 32,767 minutes? Well, 32,767 divided by 60 is 546.116 forever uh, uh, minutes. So that's the maximum precision. So we can get second precision up to 546 minutes or so, well, 546.1 minutes or so. Now, if you need 550.2395 seconds for some reason, or minutes for some reason, you'll have to do something called cascading timers. But I'm not going to show you that right now. So it's a little bit strange where these end up breaking, but it's fine. Um, so we can choose minute, uh, milliseconds, seconds, minutes, hours, or days. And, you know, 32,767 days, well, how many years is that? Let's find out. 32,767 divided by 365, uh, roughly. I know there's leap year, but we'll just neglect that. It's about 89.7 years. So probably about 90 years. I don't know that you'd have a PLC operate that long. So the, the total range of time that we can time for is pretty doggone good. I'm not going to sit here demonstrating it for that many days, obviously, though. But let's do something that would make more sense to an operator. If we're timing 10 seconds, let's just put it in seconds because it'll be right at 10 seconds. It'll be precise. It's just we can't have 10.1, right? If I put a point one in here, it doesn't accept that because it has to be an integer value. Okay, so let's time 10 seconds. And what I'll do is just uh, download and run the program. Let's see, that should reset the timer. And the reason it resets it is because when you, when you put the PLC into stop mode, the program stops running. What that means is that this preceding rung is not true, and so that resets the timer. It's in run mode, change to stop, so technically right there is where we reset the timer. Transfer is complete, okay, go to run mode. There we are. So now you can see one, two, three, four, five, very regular you know, you can see that these are seconds. It's easier to understand. Eight, nine, and there we go. Okay. Now, unfortunately, when I get to this point, what happens is the timer keeps going, right? The light has come on. You, the operator would not want to see the time keep counting down. How could I make that not happen? Well, remember there's a done bit here. So what I could do is put a, an inverting instruction referencing that done bit. So when the timer is not done, make the timer run. Let's see what happens with this. So I'll download and run it. Hit OK. Yep, just do it. And transfer is complete. Go to run mode. We're at zero. There we go. Looks good. It's running as I expected because the timer is not done. Goes to five, six, seven, eight, nine. Light should come on. And it looks like it didn't come on. In fact, the timer restarted. What happened? Well, for one scan, actually the timer or the light was on. Now, this bowl may not be able to respond that quickly. Okay, as a matter of fact, it turned on just a moment ago as well. Once this timer is done, then this instruction fires the start light. The only problem is, once the timer is done, this is no longer true, right? The inverse of true is false, so that unenables the timer. Now, I could I could do some sort of seal in or something, um, but Rather than do that, let me demonstrate a different type of timer. This is what's called a non-retentive timer. Let me change it to a retentive timer. A retentive timer is a timer that when the rung preceding it goes from false to true, it starts timing just like any other timer. But when it goes from true to false, it maintains the time it had accumulated. Okay, So I'm going to make this a retentive timer, and if you do that, then there's no way to really reset the value in the, the accumulated value because you've you know you, you've it'll never automatically reset you, you 
turning off the enable does not automatically reset it. So a reset line is provided. Now just like counters, Automation Direct software requires that you make a connection to this reset. I don't know why they do that, but it's easy enough to do. And I've got plenty of memory available, so I will just uh, use a uh, contact pointing to a memory address I'm not using, C2000 for example. And, uh, or, you know what, actually I guess I could use the reset button. Let's try that. So, the reset button will just reset it. And that would make sense. Uh, C1 address area will grab the reset button. Hit OK. There we are. And then write that into the PLC and get rid of this wiring tool. It's a little annoying. Now it'll be interesting to see what uh, the number goes to. We're, we're at five. Yeah, it goes to zero. So when you start the program, it resets all timers. So let's see. Um, the timer's not done, so it runs. When it is done, and see, it, it's still done because even though the enable has gone off, the accumulated value was not cleared by enable turning off because it's a retentive timer. And therefore, the accumulated value is equal to the preset or the, the set point. And so the, the done bit of the timer remains on. Okay, and since the done bit remains on, then that leaves the light on, which is what I wanted. Now, if I hit the reset button, that should reset the accumulated value or the current value of the timer, and the timer should run again. Let's find out. There we are. Sure enough, timer's not done, therefore light is out. Uh, the reset button was pressed which reset the, the uh, current value and now we're done again okay so that's the difference between a retentive timer and a non-retentive timer uh, let me show you I'm gonna stick with a retentive timer let me show you an off delay timer it's pretty simple all that timers do really are delays I wish they were called delays instead of timers because in the old days these were referred to essentially in, in the days of relays these were uh, timer relays instead of, or, or delay relays was even more common. Uh, but the name timer, when you think timer, you might think, well, this means I can time how long something takes. You can, but you have to program, that's not really the purpose of these things. Really, it's just to delay something. So I wish these timers were called delays because the, the on delay timer, all it does is you send an enable signal and after a delay, which is the set point, the output comes on. That's all that really happens. You can see it in the, the timing diagram here. It's pretty simple. Enable goes high and then the output bit for that timer doesn't go on until the set point time has, has been reached. And then as long as you keep the enable on, the uh, bit will stay on. But when you drop enable, that done bit drops also because, you know, it's, it, uh, well, at least if it's, if it's a uh, uh, non-retentive timer. If I go to retentive, then this timing diagram is not exactly right because then, even if I drop the enable, the done bit stays high until you do a reset. So there would need to be another line here indicating the reset and how it worked, but uh, it's understandable. The off delay timer is a little bit different. Now, with an off delay timer, they don't have the option of having a retentive timer. And the way this works is as soon as the enable goes high, the, the done bit, if you will, the output of the timer goes high. And then what happens is after the enable goes low, there's a delay in the output from the timer going low. And so again, this is why I would prefer to call it a, a delay. Since we don't have the option of retentive or non-retentive, in fact, it looks like it is uh, non-retentive, then let's see how this works. So I'll hit OK and we'll just play with this. It won't do exactly what I want, I imagine, but uh, syntax error, oh yeah. It's a non-retentive, so I don't need this stuff anymore. That should do it. It should erase uh, orphaned wires automatically. There we are. Go to run mode. Transfer is complete. There we are. Okay, so you notice that the light is on. In other words, the output, or what I call the done bit, it's not really the done bit, it's the output from the timer, is on until the timer is done. Now, you might say, well, wait a second it never finished. Well, that's because of the instruction that I'm using here. Remember, it's resetting itself automatically. So if I remove that, if I instead just put a wire in there, watch what happens. So we'll upload that to the PLC. 
Transfer is complete. Go to run mode. And so now the light's on. Let's see. Why is it not running? Oh, because enable is high, right? Enable has to go from uh, high to low. Okay. So I'll tell you what. Let's do this. I should have thought that through. If I put a button in here. Let me use the stop button. You'll see why here in a moment. Uh, not the... I grabbed the wrong area. I want the C addresses. If I grab the stop button, the stop button is a normally closed and often it's a good idea to label your buttons and things to indicate whether they're normally closed or normally open. So I'm going to go ahead and add that here. Because again, it's always a good thing to have when you're programming so you know what you're dealing with. But I wanted to use the stop button as my signal into this uh, address. And the reason for this is because, of course, normally this will pass power. And so what I'm going to do is press the button so that it doesn't pass power. That will allow me to cause the timer to run. And then when I release it, the enable will go back high and the timer will reset. So let's uh, download this and see what happens. We're in run mode, go to stop. Transfer is complete. Run, there we are. Okay, so nothing's happening right now because enable is high since the stop button is passing power. So I'm going to hold down the stop button and the enable went from high to low. So you notice now the timer is counting up time. And once it's done counting up time, the start lamp should go out and it does. Now, unfortunately, the timer keeps running, right? We don't have a a retentive timer. We don't have something to make it stop running. You could set up logic that would make it stop running, but it'd be a little more difficult than using a timer on timer. Timer on timers are much more common than timer off timers. Uh, they're just a little easier to understand, but sometimes it makes more sense to use an off delay, essentially. Which you notice in parentheses is what they've called this, is an off delay. Okay, so I said that the last thing I wanted to do is to demonstrate using a timer in the way that, or a delay, in the way that you probably thought they would be used initially when you heard the word timer. You probably thought like a kitchen timer, right? You time how much time it takes to cook a meal, you set it for 30 seconds, or maybe you measure the amount of time with a stopwatch. Maybe that's what you were thinking. I'm going to use the, the stopwatch idea. I'd like to figure out how much time it takes for a package to go from the entry of the buffer conveyor to the exit of the exit conveyor. So what I'm going to do is use a timer and I'm going to make it start and stop. Okay, I'm going to be and try to be clever about how I do this. Now I don't really have a set point. I'm not trying to get something to turn on in the timer after a certain amount of time. So I'm just going to put 32767 which is the biggest number. I'll put it in milliseconds and let's see. So that would be 32 seconds. A box should be able to traverse both conveyors in less than 32 seconds. And I'm going to use an on delay timer and I think I will retain. And the reason is because once I stop this timer running, I don't want it to just clear its value. I want to display that value on the display over here. So let's see. Um, how do I want to do this? Well, the first thing I need to do is remember that an event has occurred. So essentially that event is that this first uh, sensor was triggered. So I need to remember that and then um, at the end I have to uh, stop my timer somehow. So what will stop the timer is when a box passes the last sensor over here. Now this may be a little bit clunky way to do it but this is just the way my mind's working right now. I guess what I'm going to do is seal in a bit when this beam here is first broken. So right now it's it's closed. When a box breaks it, uh, then what will happen is it will go false. So the opposite of false is true. So let me put in the address of that exit beam. So let's see, that's at, uh, uh, at exit. There we are. And then what I want to do is I just want to seal in a memory address. So I'm going to set, rather than using a seal in circuit, I'm simply going to set memory. Now I say I never use the high addresses, but I guess I'm going to go and use the uh, probably C1000. I know I don't have any inputs connected to it on Modbus, so I'll just use C1000. So what will happen is 
when the beam at the exit is broken, in other words, when it's not true, memory bit C1000 will turn on. Now, when memory bit C1000 is on, I want to stop this timer. So instead of using this address, what I'm going to do is use C1000, and it's when it goes true that I want this to stop. So as long as it is not true, then I want the timer to run. Okay. Now, I don't really want the timer to run as long as this is not true. I actually only want it to start running when I have detected a box at the entrance. So I guess the easiest way to remember that I've detected a box at the entrance, uh, let's see, is to, let me insert a rung here. I'll do the same thing that I did before. I'll just use a memory address and set it. Let's say C1001. Pretty sure that one's not being used. In fact, I know it's not being used. And notice that this is a sensor that is normally open. In other words, it's normally not true. So when it goes true, so what's that address? Well, let's see, that's one of the C's. It's um, at buffer entry. When it goes true, I want it to I want the system to remember that a box has triggered it because I don't want subsequent boxes that are certain to come after it. I don't want those boxes to restart the timer or do anything weird with my, my bit. So now I've got a bit that tells me, hey, a box has just entered the system. If I use, How would I use that? Well, I would add an AND contact here referencing C1001. So that the only time this timer can run is when I have detected a box entering the system. So as long as a box has entered the system, this bit will be set. That means the timer can run. And as long as a box has not been detected at the exit, the timer can run. Okay. Now it's going to complain to me about the reset not being connected. So I will just connect it. Um, not by default, obviously. I don't want it to always be reset. And if you if you don't put a condition on this rung. Uh, Logix Pro, or not Logix Pro, but um, uh, the P PLC programming software, the Click programming software will, will complain. So I'm going to put just C2000 here, the, my favorite address that I don't want to use, just way out of the way. And so I don't really want this copy to occur, though, until we get to the end, until we actually know how much time is, is uh, represented here by a box traversing the entire system. So I, I don't want this to happen yet. So what I'm going to do is, um, let's see, I think what I will do is not allow this to do the copy until the box has reached the exit. So at uh, exit, so that would be bit C1000. So when that bit turns on, then the copy will happen and I'll have a nice little display over here for my operator to show how much time it took for the box to get from one end of the conveyor to the other. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually control the speed of the conveyor. I don't want to go over here in factory I.O. and then force the uh, uh, well no I, want, I do want to force the remover that way it removes boxes. There we go. But I don't want to force the belt conveyor, and I do need to force the emitter. I'll just turn it on so it emits boxes. Okay, so the PLC should have control over the buffer conveyor and uh, the exit conveyor. Well, no, there we go. Now it's released. So let's see. Let's take this back down to zero or so. There we go. Well, not negative 0.3. Not that it matters. I'm going to turn off the force, but I like for these to be at zero. There we go. So we release the force. Why is it at five again? Oh, that's because the PLC is outputting that right now. It's okay. We'll fix that in a second. So uh, it's annoying. I can hear sound. You may not be able to. Um, I'm just going to leave the force on at a very low speed so it's quiet. So what I'm going to do is write out uh, a value to control the speed of both conveyors. I want both speed, both conveyors to be set at a speed of 10. I want to time the shortest time that it takes for a box to traverse the two conveyors. So let's see, let's put in a copy. I have to put in another end, but I'm going to need another copy anyway. And uh, rather than using a source that's memory, I'm just going to put 5 in here. 
and then the destination will be to the uh, DS address that controls the conveyor speed. So that's uh, the buffer conveyor first of all is DS1, the exit conveyor is DS2. So I'll do this for both. There's DS1, so that should control the speed of the uh, buffer conveyor. Let's do the same thing for the exit conveyor and we'll just put 5 into uh, DS2. I guess I could have just typed it in so because I, I knew the address. And then finally an end instruction so it will compile and run. Okay so now I'll write this into the PLC and I think we're good to go. I, I want to think about it a little bit before I switch into run mode after downloading the, the code. Uh, let's see. That's okay. Before I go into run mode, let's see. I'll clear the docked tags. I'm only forcing emitter and um, remover so that I can get boxes in and out of the system. The counter, I, I want to see what happens, so I guess I'm going to back off just a little bit and we'll see this counter go up, but I can't really see everything at once and read it well. Well, maybe I can, actually. If I were to spin around a little bit and then move over to the side, maybe I could see the box go to the uh, exit. So kind of look down the conveyor. Uh, maybe a little more spin. There we go. Now I can't really see uh, the box break the beam. The beam's kind of behind the control box, but at least I can sort of see where I can see the counter. I can I'll see the tip of the box come out. That'll be good enough. I'll see the box go off here. So I think what should happen is both the buffer and uh, exit conveyor should turn on. And as soon as a box, you know what, let me cancel this. I don't want to go into run mode yet. Let me make one more change. As soon as a box comes on, uh, what I'm going to do, instead of using that memory address, C1001, I'm going to change this. I'd like to see a light come on. I'm going to, I, I just want to see the run light come on when the box hits the first sensor, and then the stop light come on when it exits. I think I'd like that better. It'll make it a little more visual. So at exit will be stop. As a matter of fact, uh, can I cut this rung and then paste above, uh, let's see, insert rung before cursor and at that rung I want to paste. There we go. So I just reversed the order and so at buffer entry that's what's going to happen first. It doesn't really matter because remember the PLC is scanning this. It's just it helps me think about it uh, right. So it'll go through this you know, rung two many, many, many times before it actually sets the output. But the output I want it to set is the lamp. So I'm going to use that as a memory bit instead. That way I can also see it happen. I, I like visual things. So let's see, the output is going to be the Y's and it's the start light. That'll be good. And so everywhere I had C1001, I need to replace it with Y002. And you can actually do a replace in the software. In fact, I'll demonstrate that next. Uh, so there's a couple of C1000 addresses. There's one here. If you're worried about making a replacement one place and not everywhere, you can actually choose what address you want to make the replacement. Uh, for example, here I want to use the stoplight, which is Y004. I'm going to cancel this. And you can do an edit uh, replace. And everywhere it finds C1000, I want it to put, what was that, Y, oh goodness, I've lost it. It was the start light on 2, I thought reset was on 3, and maybe 4 is the stop. I don't know. We can do another replace if necessary. Y004. Now it does not like that. Why not? Well, that is the stop light. Let's say replace all. It says can't replace because the following memory address is out of range. Memory types are different. Fields not complete. Okay, so if I put uh, C1000, yeah, this is not as powerful as a, a replace as I would like. So maybe I'm doing something wrong, but I don't think so. I think it doesn't like the fact that the C1000 is, is a different kind of memory than Y004. Um, maybe it's something I'm missing. Looks like I'll have to do the replacement myself. 
but that's okay. Y004, there's only a few places. The problem with doing a manual replacement is you might miss one. It's nice to have the machine do it for you, but looks like that's not an option unless there's something I don't know about the software. So we've got the stoplight everywhere now instead of that memory bit. And so now let me download this. The PLC is still in stop mode. So it shouldn't ask about switching to stop mode. Yeah, I think I'll like that better. So now let's go to run mode. The simulator is running. So we should see the start light come on pretty quickly once a box passes it. And then the stop light come on. And we should see our count on the uh, count display over there, our time on the count display. Now the stop light came on immediately. And I don't know why they are stacking up because it looks like yeah, things are not working the way I expected. I think I've got a bug in my uh, my program. Let's figure out what happened. Let's go and view the tags so we can tell what's going on. Ah, the problem is I forced the exit conveyor. So let me release it. Now it's running. I'm going to stop the simulation. I'm going to put the PLC into stop mode. I'm going to get these tags out of my way. I think I've still got a bug. Clear docked tags. Uh, the simulator's reset, so now we can play. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so now let's go into run mode again on the PLC. And let's see, no time has accumulated. That's good. The lights aren't on because the boxes have not started moving, so let's just hit play. The conveyors come on. My start light did come on, but for some reason, my stop light came on prematurely. I don't know why. Let's see, let me reset this thing. Okay, so let's uh, go to stop mode. We'll stop our system here. I'm going to watch the PLC a little more closely now. So I'm going to go to run mode. Let's see. As soon as I turn on... Oh, I know what's happening. As soon as I turn on the simulator, it takes a little bit of time for that lamp to detect. Uh, the, the lamp has to turn on, right? So initially, this memory address is not on. So what I'm going to have to do to make this stoplight go on is say, well, I have to have seen a box at the entry and then also, in other words, and see it at the exit. Because watch, if I hit run, the at exit immediately comes on. Right? Now you didn't see it on because it's very fast, right? Um, but sure enough, power was not getting through until a box got there and yet the set came on. So what I'll need to do is change my program just a little bit. And make it so that I've got another condition here. Which is just really uh, C1. So I don't really want this stop memory to come on until two things have happened. Until I've seen a box come through the entrance and and actually, I guess a better way to say that is Y002, because the uh, th that would have worked, but this is more correct, because I want to remember that I've seen a box at the entrance, and now I see a box at the exit, so the stoplight comes on. That should make it work. So let's download this. Oop, didn't want to upload. Cancel. I wanted to write this program into the PLC, not the other way around. So I'll say OK. I'm going to go ahead and put factory I.O. in run mode. Hit OK. Put the PLC into run mode and we should see it work. And nothing. Why? Let me hit stop and run again. Let's see, we know that we're putting out information on the motors, dock all tags. It's set to 5, and yet it's not running. I think this is a factory I.O. bug. 
Let me uh, disconnect from the PLC and then reconnect in factory I.O. So drivers we will disconnect and then reconnect. And then run. Let's try stopping the PLC and then... Oh, it's in stop mode. No, it's not. It's in run mode. So we'll say stop. And now let's go back into run mode. That's not doing it. Th my conveyors are not running. Well, just for the sake of the timer, I'm going to force the conveyors. I don't know why there's some communication problem between the two. But I'm going to turn on the um, exit conveyor at a level of 5. So it is forced and force the buffer conveyor and yet they are still not running. As I said, I think this is a factory I.O. bug because it should certainly be running right now. I don't know why it stopped. I'm going to exit factory I.O. and uh, save the changes and then go back into factory I.O. Let's see if that makes a difference. Pull it over, well, try to pull it over to the side, come on. And then what I did was I set up a custom scene so I could have my Modbus addresses connected. And I had called it counter demonstration because that's what I used it for in the past. So now we should be able to go and uh, drivers connect to the PLC. So it's connected, and then run the simulation. There we are. So let's see, that worked. The uh, start time, uh, or when the box came through, it started the light, or turned on the light, and when the box finally ended, it, it stopped it. So now I can go and view the uh, camera navigation so I can move over and see that it took uh, 44.95 what does that mean? 44.95 what? Well it took, um, let's see, this is in milliseconds I believe. Yeah, milliseconds. So it took uh, 4.495 seconds to get over there. What if we were to drive the conveyor at full speed? What if we went to a speed of 10 instead? So we'll just put 10 into the buffer conveyor and into the uh, exit conveyor. So I'm going to pause this and reset it. And then, uh, let's see, I should be able to download this to the PLC, which should reset the timer. So, okay. Yes. Transfer is complete. Go to run mode. There we go. It seems to have trouble when I go to run mode when I, I guess maybe wasn't in stop. Let me make this uh, stop and then um, we'll run the simulation and then go to run mode again here. No, this is strange. I don't know why it's doing this. It'll just be a different amount of time, but I want to see it. So let me exit factory IO. I guess I'll pause the PLC again. Restart factory IO. It's probably something I'm doing wrong or a bug like I said in factory IO. Scenes, my scenes, and we'll grab the um, counter demonstration. So let's see, we'll run this one. Oh drat, that's not what I wanted. Let's go to run mode here. I hope that doesn't mess up my settings. There we are. Now it's not running at the speed I wanted, and of course the reason is because I forgot, I think I forced everything. Let me look at the docked tags. Yeah, I'm forcing. So let me release. There we are. Reset everything, but for some reason, these are no longer riding properly. Oh, I bet I know what it is. I forgot to set my memory addresses. Uh, configuration. No, I've got them set. Oh, <laughs> I'm not connected. There we go. Let's connect to the PLC.
There we go, now we're going a lot faster. So the number here was our number from the last exper experiment, 4489 or whatever it was. But that's just because the memory address had not changed. The actual value uh, in DS3 had not changed because the stoplight hadn't been written. So it was just showing the old value. And I, that's annoying. Uh, I don't know if you could hear that, but it was pretty loud. So now the, the count is 2238. That's how many seconds, well, milliseconds it took. So 2.238 seconds at full speed is how long it took. One mistake that students often make in trying to use timers is they, they use them for the wrong thing. So, for example, if we didn't have a sensor at the end of this conveyor system, a lot of students would think, well, that's no problem. What I'll do is I'll just start a timer when the box triggers the first sensor, and then I'll make sure that the timer, you know, I'll go and I'll measure the system, see how long it takes with a stopwatch for the box to get to the end, and that's the, the set point I'll put in my timer, and then you know, in my program, when the timer is triggered by the box coming in, then after the timer is done, because I've, I've measured the, the time, the box should be at the end of the conveyor line, right? Well, that's not always the case. Like you can see here, the conveyor speed could be increased or decreased, or maybe a worker comes along and pulls the box off the line. You can never guarantee that the machine reaches a point after a certain amount of time. You can only guarantee that the machine has done what it's supposed to do once a sensor is triggered. And even then it's not a complete guarantee because the sensor could be bad. So students will very often try to use a timer when they should be using a sensor. And I see this very often in student projects. So they'll say, well, we know when this moves it takes a certain amount of time so we're just going to put a timer in and we know the, the thing will be there once the time has elapsed. And that is a huge mistake. Uh, very often what you need instead is simply a sensor. So a, a very common problem is that students try to use timers when they should have added a sensor to their, their system. One last thing I want to say about timers. Uh, it's a common misconception from, stu from students. Counters are edge triggered. So the enable or the count up, count down inputs on counters are edge triggered. So they sense changes in inputs. On the other hand, timers are level triggered. So you have to maintain the enable signal going into the timer for it to keep running. And that's a fundamental difference between the two. Even though both of them are essentially counters in that one counts events and the other one counts time, uh, the, the thing that makes them go, right, the, the enable, the count up, the count down, is fundamentally different in how it responds to either level triggering or edge triggering. So you need to remember that because you might start to blur the lines in your mind between timers and counters and it's important to remember that there are differences and there's a lot of options obviously with timers as well in terms of whether it's an on delay or an off delay and whether it's retentive or not. Uh, I typically use on delay because you can do anything with an on delay you can do with an off delay and then that gives me the option of uh, having a retentive timer. Um, obviously we can time over very wide range. You would call this the basis. The timing basis is just the units that you're measuring time in. Obviously if you change that you can you know have a very different amount of time. So I hope this un helps you understand how timers work and demonstrated it for you so that you can use them in your own projects.